Okay. Well, hello. This is Jeff Gadiosi, and you're on MisplacedStraws.com, where music comes to life. I have a really special guest today. Vinny Mad Dog Lopez is the legendary Hall of Fame inducted founding drummer of the E Street Band, as well as having played with Bruce Springsteen in a bunch of earlier bands. Since then, he's played in a lot of bands on the Jersey Shore, and he even made an appearance at the U.S. Open. And he's kind enough to take some time to talk about his story. Welcome, Vinny. Hey, how are you doing, okay? I'm doing great. Thanks. It's a beautiful day out here in Jersey. Mm-hmm. Yes, same. I'm right in Connecticut, so we got that same sunny weather. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, let's start at the beginning of the beginning. Um, you attended high school with Gary Talent and Southside Johnny. I mean, did you guys all play together in bands? Did you hang out? How did you well, all meet? Well, John and I, we were in a lot of the same classes together. He's right next to me in the yearbook. You know, his mm-hmm. picture and my picture are together. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in, in those days, bef- you know, before mm-hmm. Upstage. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I I played with Sonny and the Starfires. Mm-hmm. Okay, with Sonny Ken and the fellas in that band, and uh, we went on for a while, and then I became friends with Gary. And I went over and I started playing with him and Tommy Wario and Ricky DeSarno in the moment of truth. Okay. And that was like the end of 66, 1967, Hmm. you know, let's say. So that's when we all kind of graduated high school. So during high school, I was actually with Sonny, but you know, after we graduated or that year, that's when I actually started playing with Gary. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so that that's the the story about about that. And John, now as the moment of truth, that year the upstage opened, and that's when we all kind of meshed together because you know we're in the upstage. We're right. all helping Tom Potter out, you know, do, doing whatever Tom needed us to do. And so Danny, that's, that's the but and, you know, Danny was sort of the next one to kind of come into the fold. And then, you know, the story we always saw was that it was you guys at the upstage who brought Bruce into your group. Well, that's that's basically mm-hmm. what happened. Uh, Danny and I, now this is after the moment of truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I started playing with, with Billy Chinnick. And we had a band uh, called the Downtown Tangiers Rock and Rhythm and Blues Band. And it was Danny and myself, Wendell on bass, and Billy Chinnick on the guitar. And he was a singer-songwriter. We toured uh, with the Electric Circus. Uh, and we did 40, 40 dates uh, out with the Electric Circus. We were the house band. Uh, the, Tangier, the downtown Tangier yeah. band was the house band. And uh, that band eventually, I mean, just through... Bill wanted the bass player, Wendell, to sing, actually sing lead mm-hmm. in the band, and he wanted to bring Gary into the band. But uh, Wendell didn't want to hear none of that. <laughs> Wendell liked playing the bass. <laughs> so what happened is the band broke up. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's it's pretty simple from there. Danny and I still wanted to play together. We became friends, and we were looking for guys who could write songs, uh, and we could do original music, not have to go play in the gin mills that we all played in. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to do that, but we wanted to do original music, and we went and searched, and there was a few, a lot of guys around that that we looked at, but there was only one guy who was actually, and, and when I first met Bruce, when I went up to him, I said, hey, uh, I just want to talk to you for a minute. I'm Vinny. He goes, oh, I know you. You play with Sonny. Hmm. You know, Bruce says to me. So I said, uh, yeah, I, I did, because Bruce used to come watch Sonny play guitar. Because, mm-hmm. you know, he dug the way that, that Sonny played. And uh, he goes, I know you. I said, well, Vinny, I don't want to make a band. Do you write any songs? And he goes, well, I've written a couple. <laughs> you know. 
think about that for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I've written a couple. So we'll do a couple more later on. I said, well, let's just get together. There's a place down in the yeah. upstage, you know, and let's, let's get down there. Maybe we can jam, mm-hmm. see what we can do. Okay, okay. So now a few weeks go by. Danny and I are walking into the upstage. We go up to the third floor, and there is Bruce, Little Vinnie Roslin, and Big Bobby Williams on the stage playing. And uh, I said, Danny, this is the guy. And then Margaret Potter was standing there. She's one of the owners of the upstage, and she's mm-hmm. telling us, you know, how great Bruce is, and boy, I haven't heard anything like this in, in so many years, uh, but, and how great he was. Charisma, charisma. So mm-hmm. after they got done playing, me and Danny went up to the stage and said, hey, why don't we jam? Let, let's us jam. And he said, okay, yeah. So we got special permission from Tom Potter to jam, and it was myself. And it was Lil Vinny, and it was Bruce and Danny. And we just got up and just started playing things, whatever, blues, you know, whatever we all do in conjunction, you know. And um, that made the band. From then on, we were we were a band. And downstairs and sealed it up. And, the green and, made. and that was, you know, the groundwork was now set. I mean, that's the birth of, you know, what became Steel Mill and Dr. Zoom and the Sonic Boom and eventually E Street. Right. And as things were changing kind of rapidly at that time, you know, with various bands and band members, did you always think that, okay, the the next version of the band is really going to be the one that sticks? Oh, we didn't have any plans on going anywhere else. We were quite happy with the way it turned, you know, the way we were turning things out, Hmm. you know, and uh, I went up uh, to Bruce because years before that, when I was in the moment of truth, this guy comes up to me from California. His name is Pinker, mm-hmm. you know, and he says, hey, you know, you guys, the moment of truth, that's a good band, good band, but you're not doing any original music. Where I come from, everybody does original music and blah, 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 blah. But then, then I went on and hooked up with Danny and Chinnick, and we were doing original music, but mm-hmm. Chinnick was self-contained. But after that is when I took Bruce and we went up and saw Tinker. And Tinker said, yeah. And he had the surfboard factory. And he had a place to rehearse. He had a place where we could stay. He had cars and trucks. <laughs> he had things that we, that he let us use to continue to work and play. And he became like our manager. And he's and really Paris. sort of an unsung figure in, you know, the birth of the E Street Band. You know, Tinker West is, you know, just as important as, you know, all of the guys in the band to the start of it. Oh, yeah. Hmm. You know, and at this point, too, you know, Bruce eventually gets signed as a solo artist, but comes back to the upstage, you know, looking for you and Clarence and Danny and David Sanchez for the greetings from Asbury Park record eventually. And what do you remember kind of about that period of recording the record? Well, we were well rehearsed. You know, I was Mm -hmm. at that point, Bruce was a solo artist. You know, there was no Phil Miller broken up. Mm-hmm. There was no Zoom band. There was no Bruce Springsteen band. There was nothing. You know, Bruce was being Bruce, and he auditioned, uh, you know, for John Hammond. Uh, and uh, then I get a phone call at the boatyard where I was working. And uh, it's Bruce. And he goes, you want to make a record? And I said, <laughs> yeah. Let's make a record. So we went. We all got together. Uh rehearsed in uh, the uh, Dan Electro factory down in Point Pleasant mm-hmm. amongst us and a few other little places, but that was one of the places that we rehearsed in for about a week, week and a half, learning the songs Bruce wanted to do on the record. And then when we went in to actually record at 914, all the basic tracks, all the, all the basic tracks basically went down in one shot. Mm-hmm. Because we we knew them, we knew how they went, you know, and uh, it, w- it was pretty quick because like it seemed like a week later after we did the initial tracks and some vocals, the thing was out. Readings, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, here we go. Now we're on the road. You know, hey, when it comes to recording that record, the the thing that always stuck in my mind the story is you know. 
Blinded by the Light and Spirit in the Night, you know, both recorded on the same day, more or less as a trio with just you, Bruce, and Clarence. And, you know, those are probably the well, two songs. Well, no, me and Bruce did a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Clarence, you know, came in later. You know, I mean, he didn't come in right the same day. You know, we were so on all, that original recording, David. Yeah, that was all. Great. You know, but there was uh, three of us. If you look at the mm -hmm. liner notes and stuff, you see how it was put together. Mm -hmm. Gary came in, you know, and then we then we saw what solidified the band really yeah. right there. You know. And you know, you guys started touring pretty much as soon as the record was recorded. You know, before it even came out. Yep. And on those in early dates, did you really feel this version of the E Street Band, you know, gelling and finding its footing on those early shows? Well, that's what we were doing. We were finding yeah. our footing. Mm -hmm. And we were, let's say, we wanted to go to the top. Mm -hmm. You know, like John Lennon said, to the very top. Mm -hmm. And uh, we figured that like we opened for Chicago, we did you know, tours like that. Mm -hmm. We figured if we reached like maybe maybe one percent of all the people that were in the audience, we were doing good. Mm -hmm. That's that's how we looked at it. Yeah, let's just keep blowing it away mm -hmm. at it. You know, going to Mike's office, mm -hmm. sending out envelopes full of records and mm -hmm. promo. We all did this. You know, uh, we all stuck to it, and it was. It was a grind, uh, but it was something that went, once went, once we got going, we became a better band at it. It was hard to find a better band. And I think that really showed um, the Wild, the Innocent, and the E Street Shuffle. Um, musically, it turned into longer songs, a jazzier influence, more stretched out musical passages. You know, was that a result of what you guys were doing on stage that you kind of well, brought those jams into the studio? The jams were always the jams. Mm -hmm. No matter when we played live, mm -hmm. there was always jams. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, the songs became cut and dried, so we had a half hour every time we put open to Chicago. So now we had to do cut and dried stuff. Mm -hmm. But when we got playing, like we always jammed out. Stillmo was a big jam band. Mm -hmm. um, now, The Wild, The Innocent, that took a little longer because we were out on the road when we recorded that. Mm -hmm. You know, so we'd come home and uh, we'd have three days off in between this trip and that trip. And that's where we'd go to the studio. So days off weren't days off. They were in mm -hmm. the studio and we spent, you know, we were at the graveyard shift most of the time after midnight when we started recording. And we ended up, me and Clarence, I had a big tent. <laughs> I was talking to Gary about my big tent uh, <laughs> just the other day, as a matter of fact. Because he lived on, uh, oh, I forget the name of the street, Gary. He lived on in Neptune City. And a good friend of mine, Charlie McCann, lived across the street from him. And in Charlie's backyard, I put my big army tent up. Where we could all go hang out in the army tent, you know. <laughs> this is when we were kids. So I still had the tent. So what I did was when we started recording and had to be at 914 all these hours, I put the tent in the back. And it became the original, you know, uh, temple of soul. <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, me and Clarence hung out in there. Nobody else wanted to really go in there. <laughs> that, that's okay. Me and Clarence were quite happy with nobody else. I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, you know, it, again, Pretty much E Street was always on tour and just kind of recording in between. So yep. did you do a lot of the tour for Wild and Innocent? All of it. Mm -hmm. Until the 74. Yeah. And, you know, but yeah, oh yeah, every, every, you know, all of it. And when you kind of look back on those shows, is there a certain show or a certain stretch of shows that always stands out in your mind? I mean, everything has been bootleg. There's copies everywhere. But is there one that you look back to and say, yeah, that was us at the height of our powers? Well, there's shows that we played that um, aren't on any bootlegs. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, what was it? The, what was it called? 
uh, there was a place in Washington, in, in uh, Georgetown, that we played in a little bitty club. We the 930? A week. What's that? The 930 club? No, no. <laughs> Oh, what the hell is it called? I keep getting yeah. Child Harold, but I, that's not it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we, we played in this club, you know, for, like we always did for five days, mm-hmm. and then we'd move on to another club. But the owner took good care of us. We always had a nice dinner. We could always have, uh, you know. But this one time, Clarence went somewhere, and he got himself a bottle of Jack Daniels that wasn't number seven. <laughs> it was something else. So, before the show, me and Sanchez and Clarence, and Dan, we all, well, I don't know if Danny was here with the show. I don't think he was. But we all drank this Jack Daniels. <laughs> it was the best show we ever fucking did. <laughs> I mean, it was incredible. And we were, and that's when we were like, you know, because me and, me and, uh, and, and you talked about the jazz of the second round. Mm-hmm. Well, that's from David. Yeah, I played with David. You know, when, mm-hmm. you know when I when I play, I play along with the guys. I don't mm-hmm. force them to go somewhere. I go with them. Mm-hmm. And because of David's prowess, the way he played, I started playing like that. You know, and then that's like uh, on the second record a lot with, with David doing hits and you know stabs and riffs. You know. And over the years, there's been a lot of songs that were recorded in that time for, you know, both of those records that turned up beyond the tracks, box set, and on various things like that. As far as you know, are there any others that you remember working on that haven't seen the light of day yet, or is everything out from that period? Oh, I'm sure. I mean, there's songs that we used to do that I don't believe on any recordings. Mm Mm-hmm. You know that I wish were on some recordings. You know, Tinker uh, had all the tapes of every show mm-hmm. that you know back then, and uh, Tinker says he gave them all to Bruce. So now, whether or not uh, uh, Bruce will ever uh, release any of those, he has mm-hmm. a few. Yep. You know, a few of them. But, you know, they got the quality. There's a quality thing. You know, we did the whole show, uh, the, the Zoom band, with uh, the Allman Brothers. We opened for them at the oh, wow. Sunshine Inn in Asbury yeah. Park, you know. And uh, it was like a week before you got killed on the motorcycle, mm-hmm. too. Uh, but, you know, we were, we were two drummers. We were, It was uh, there was stuff there that just isn't recorded but Tinker mm-hmm. had a recording of that but it had a buzz all the way through the through the song right. so none of it could you couldn't get the buzz mm-hmm. out of it you know so it's mm-hmm. it's great recording we had a good time doing it but uh there was a buzz so it never got used there's all kinds mm-hmm. of probably little things like that that never and now after this period um you left the band uh you know, the, the story is the argument with Mike Appel and his brother and all that. But after when all those contract issues started coming to light, I mean, did, was there sort of a, I don't want to say a vindication, but did you, was there kind of like, that's what I've been, you know, that's what I was arguing about kind of feel for you? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, um, you know, somebody, a few people told me, you know, he says, you know, it was the same the way went, things went down. But, you know, that's what you said was was the truth, mm-hmm. you know, because I, I try and protect the people that right. I work with. And I still do that mm-hmm. right now with my, with my guys. And um, not so much protection against, but just, you know, are you nuts? That's not the way things are supposed to go. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and uh, a lot of what I was saying, I learned from the people that have gone before me. Like Chinnick taught me a lot about uh, 
the music industry, Mm -hmm. the way they work it, publishing, stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, I wouldn't do that because if you do that, then you don't own your stuff. Right. Don't don't do that. Don't Mm -hmm. get a lawyer. You know, but but stuff like that just uh, went over people's heads when I was saying it because, hey, I'm just a drummer. I don't know nothing. <laughs> yeah. So it's okay. And now everything turns out good. Yeah. yeah. You know. <laughs> I, and, I <laughs> and, well, and after leaving the band, I mean, you kept really active. You're, you know, a lot of bands on the Jersey Shore. And um, but I think one thing that will kind of surprise a lot of people is where your love of golf took you. Um, talk a minute about your journey, you know, to both the U.S. Open and the U.S. Senior Open. Well, we, uh, in fact, we, we were just in the, uh, month, last Monday in the senior, to <laughs> now it's senior. <laughs> yeah. Time flies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we were just, and we, we can't, we're a second alternate, uh, for the PGA, uh, in our section. So not that I don't think we're going to go to any more place to work, but, um, I started playing golf. And this is a little story about it. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when I went to Monmouth College, 1967, beginning 68, uh, I met a guy named Joe Lanzetta. And uh, he was a golfer, aspiring to be a pro. His father was a pro. He owned Colonial Terrace in Asbury Park, this little nine-hole golf course that's right there on the outskirts of Asbury Park. And we went there every day after school, and I learned how to play golf. And I was getting pretty darn good at it. And then we went Bruce, and we went out on tour. There was no more golf. Mm -hmm. There was no more golf for like 10 years. Okay. But before that, now, here's this little kid, Joe's little brother, Michael. And he's got this afro. He's like nine years old. Mm -hmm. He's got a big afro. And and me and Joey, Joey had the Mustang, you know, the top down. And we were always just getting in the Mustang and driving to the middle of Pennsylvania, driving up to New York State, just driving. And Michael was always bugging us to go someplace, you know. But now Michael, (laughs) he's in the senior PGA, too. (laughs) (laughs) We were sitting talking about this just the other day, Michael and I. You know, I mean, but it, it, it's incredible how things work like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I I got a job uh, as a, uh, I wore a lot of hats at Hollywood Golf mm-hmm. Club. I, I painted. I was a caddy. I, was, I worked at Bag Room. I was assistant caddy master at times. I did a lot of different things there for like eleven years. But that's where I met a whole load of pro golfers who I started caddying for. Jimmy Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he was he was a, a big uh, proponent of me because I could play golf. So he said, you, right. you should come to Hollywood mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and you know, do what you do. I said, okay. So I did, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm working. I'm, I'm caddying. <laughs> but then, you know, I, I, the, the pros would have their – own little in tournaments on Mondays at Hollywood, and they'd all come over and gamble. Well, Mark asked me, Mark McCormick, he says, listen, I'm in an assistance tournament on next Monday. Would you caddy for me? I said, sure. And we've been together ever since. <laughs> you know, and uh, through thick and thin, we tried to get into the U.S. Open. We tried, I <laughs> bet you, 25 times. Missed by one stroke. You know, 10 of them 25 times. And then the one time you get in, you know, it, it was quite incredible getting into the U.S. I would imagine. And being out there at an Olympic club and being with all the big boys, you know, mm. something. Very cool. And you've also, I mean, you've reunited with Bruce on stage a lot over the years. Um, but probably the biggest one was the long overdue induction of the band itself, the E Street Band, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2014. Yep. And I mean, I was fortunate enough to be there and watch you guys go in. What was that like for you? You know, that speech and being on that stage, finally getting that recognition after all these years. Well, I never expected it. it mm-hmm. When I got the, you know, the call from Landau, 
you know, I said, oh, okay. You know, and, and one thing that, um, that I did that, um, uh, I think, uh, looking back at it, it was something because, you know, they say, well, what do you, what do you want to do? You know, I said, you put two drum sets up on the stage mm-hmm. when we play, let me play with Max, <laughs> you know, and he went, I don't know. And, and then, but they did it. Yep. And they put two drum sets up there. And now we go to the, the sound check the morning of the, we were in the morning of the thing. And uh, there's the two drum sets. So there's one up a little higher than the other one. And the one up a little higher had Clarence's sax and Danny's accordion in front of it. <laughs> so I get on the lower one. And Max goes, oh, no, 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 no. You're up there. You go on that one. And right then I got up like, oh, my, I'm right in front of him. I'm right next to Sanchez. Yeah. Horns are right behind me. Oh, <laughs> hey, this, this is fun. So before, and we did the songs. Now, before we went out to do the sound check, I'm in the room talking to Max. And I'm going, Max, you've been with the band 40 years now. You play. I know what to do behind you. Don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to lay back. And, and Steve Van Zandt was standing over here. And he goes, Vinny, what the fuck are you talking about? Said, what do you mean? <laughs> he says, look. You do all them licks. When them licks come in them songs, I want you doing them licks. <laughs> you hear me? He said, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> so I, that's what I did. <laughs> it, it was, you know, but it was, it was ter- terrific fun. Mm-hmm. It was tremendous fun, you know, hanging out with all them guys. You know, I got, uh, I got 40 people into the after party. You know. <laughs> my daughter was there with all her buddies, you know, so I, that shows over, so I've had my, my trophy, you know. So mm-hmm. I go over, I see Liz. I say, Liz, come on down. The guard goes, oh, no, she can't come down here with those people. I said, and I held the trophy up, and I went, they're with me. <laughs> and there they are. That's and then key. some yeah. people from Northville were up there, my yeah. friends Anthony, Lanzi, and stuff. Mm-hmm. They were up here, and I grew, well, we all walked over to them, and I said, hey, Anthony, come on, we're all going to the party. <laughs> oh, they can't come down here with you nuts. I said, no, they're with me. <laughs> and they're with me. Now people are walking and I'm thinking, come on, let's go. We get people with us. We go up the stairs and there's the guys from Kiss coming down the elevator. Mm. I said, where are you guys going? Hey, they don't like us here. I went up the elevator, went down the elevator. I said, no, no, come on, you're with me. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a good time. <laughs> you I know, bet you did. That, that, whole, that, whole, that whole time was just incredible. Hanging with Peter Chris, you know, that was one of my favorite things that we did. He was such a nice guy, and he's a local. Mm-hmm. He lives here, yeah. Jersey, you know, so it, it was good. And, and uh, I remember hearing a few years back that you were thinking about writing a book and things like that. Yeah. I mean, any updates on what's going on now and what oh, will be coming up in the future? Yeah, it's coming up in the near future. We got a lot in the can, so mm-hmm. it's a matter of uh, we're talking to a lot of people. People are giving us interviews, mm-hmm. um, but my book is going to be quite simple. It's not about. I'm not bashing anyone. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about, you know, how much money we lost or how much money we made. You know, I'm talking about all good stories that through my life, things that I did, right, and things that I did with maybe this person and this person's going to tell a story about those days. You know, Mm. the last chapter in my book is going to be my friends telling a story about me. (laughs) The last chapter. So it's not going to be probably the worst stuff going to be in that book is about me. (laughs) You know, and I, I I didn't do anything really bad. I just stuck up for people. And uh, in those days where I came from, Sticking up for your friends was big, mm-hmm. you know, no matter what anybody thinks. That's the way I approached it, you know, to, to, to let, hey, wait, you can't talk to him. Don't talk to him. Or somebody's going to beat up a bass player. Right. I'm going to jump in and go, no, nah, you're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, that's not happening. Well, you know, so one time I, I this guy was going to beat up a uh, good friend of mine and he's been and they're rocking his car out in the parking lot of this club 
And I came out, and I'm in a suit <laughs> because they wanted me to be their manager of this band. <laughs> so I'm in a suit and a tie, and I see this happening. So I go over, and I put my hand in my pocket in, in my suit coat like this, and I tap the guy on the shoulder, put my hand in my pocket, and I said, uh, hey. He turns around and says, you got a gun? He goes, no. I said, then you're in more shit than you've ever been in in your life, right? <laughs> Get away from him. And I had my hand like I had a gun. Yeah. <laughs> they believed me. <laughs> it's all how you sell it, my friend. <laughs> it's all how you sell it. But I ain't going to let him get shit on because of you, you creep, you know, because you didn't like he had long hair, and that's what it was about, you know. Yeah. Well, but little, yeah. little stuff like that, you know. Definitely looking forward to the book, and um, they will cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Vinny, I, I can't thank you enough for taking some time to do this. I, I'm a huge fan, so this has been a highlight for me getting to talk with you and hearing your stories oh, and getting pleasure. your story out there. I really appreciate it. And um, keep in touch when the book comes out, and we'll do this again and help uh, promote oh, that. And I absolutely, yeah. Have. And you'll know. You'll know when the yep. book comes out. But one thing I want to say is, like, mm-hmm. you know, now in my life, I do a lot of work with Light of Day. Yes. Yeah, and actually talk a little about that. Yep. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to mm-hmm. mention the fact that, uh, you know, this year, everything because of this virus is down. You know, there's nothing mm-hmm. going on. But I've been for the last six years going to Europe with Light of Day, doing the Europe tour, and bringing awareness uh, for that crummy disease that uh, people have, but I've made so many friends over the world. And uh, and these are people that, they know how I am, and, and I'm still the same way. If you're going to, if you rub me the wrong way, I'm going to say, wow. But now I'm more mm-hmm. of a diplomat. <laughs> now I don't bring out the, you know, the 20 ton phasers, you know. Yeah. So I just, I say, wait, come on. That's, that's wrong. But I don't do that a lot because there's no reason to. Mm-hmm. Because everybody is so cool and, and so nice, and I've made so many nice friends all over the world, you know, just just through Parkinson's disease and other charities that I work with, City of Angels here in Trenton, where mm-hmm. I live, you know, helping addiction. You know, it's so important, and I, hey, at least I can I can do that, and I really it makes makes everybody very happy. You know, when we see the results. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, again, Vinny, thank you so much. Hey, uh, thank you. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed our conversation. I look forward to talking more. Um, anytime you have something going on, whether it's the Light of Day shows, your book, whatever, let me know. We'll get the word out there to everybody. And cool. thank you so much, my friend. Have a great weekend. Hey, you too. And uh, yep. it is going to be a hot one, so stay cool. You too. And stay safe. <laughs> Stay Thank safe. you very much. Boat, boat, boat. Always, yes. All right. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye. Bye.